Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we explore America's ongoing and persistent issues when it comes to race and social justice. In particular, holding a mirror up to all of us in the U.S. so we can face our history and do the work required to push back on the structural racism that marginalizes, restricts, and harms our black and brown neighbors. And also to make room for voices outside the mainstream to have a seat at the table. Our guest is Barry Thomas, professional educator and community advocate and activist in Omaha, Nebraska. Barry is concerned about issues related to race within the country and has dedicated his time to addressing these issues and educating others. While this interview was recorded just prior to the police killing of George Floyd and the subsequent protests and unrest, our conversation remains relevant given the fact that both Floyd's killing and the killing of Ahmaud Arbery and others stem from the same systemic racism that permeates U.S. society. This interview is part two of my interview with Barry Thomas. You can hear part one at newsincontext.net. I think it comes down to American values, or I shouldn't even say American values, because it's really the values of capitalism, to where in order for me to have, you you can't have. And I think institutionally and, and systemically, that's just how the design of this society leads us to believe that we should exist, right? You could pair it on race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity. You can... You can split it however you want to with all with all of the things that we are, right? If I'm a man, then there are certain things that I believe I'm entitled to that women are not entitled to, right? And, and everybody can kind of look at it and divide ourselves because it's truly how we make the world make sense based off of our values is division. We create borders to say this is what this county can have versus this is what that county can have. And people that live in the county that get less always are upset with the people who are in the county that get more. And the people who are in the county that get more, most oftentimes don't even realize that they are in a county that gets more. When you are emerged in this existence of having, you have a hard time understanding what it's like to be in a world where you don't have. And so the question you asked was really, it was the answer itself. You said something about not being able to understand the people that live next to me, right? The, the viewing of someone as being next to you as opposed to being in something with you, that's the answer. We, we feel like we are next to other people as opposed to standing side by side, right? So next to allows that space to be, you're over there, I'm over here. But when I say we're together, then that means that as you step, I step, as you breathe, I breathe, as you live, I live. And we have to get rid of the next two mentality and, and start going into and trying to understand how the together can really can really help us. A couple episodes ago, you, uh, you had a, a conversation about seeing. I think that's at the core uh, of a lot of this. You know, I don't know and I don't see what's happening in the county next to me. I live in a state that, that had some serious flooding last year and it was hard for me to get up the wheel to do something for those who had been suffering flooding 
because when I walked out of my house, it was dry. I don't know what that's like to have to go through that. But it also led me to think differently because the places that were getting flooded were in rural areas and I'm in an urban area too. So not only was it just the, the flooding that was taking place was different from mine, but also I know that in my state, we protect our rural folks very well. Our farmers are, they're subsidized, right? The government sets up to where those individuals don't have to worry about getting taxed. They actually can get money from the government. That difference in itself, again, system, right? They're next to, but not together. And so I see them as getting a subsidy for the work that they're doing through agriculture while I pay taxes. That makes it so it's different. And, and that came up true, again, talking about this COVID-19 response. Even uh, I think Cuomo was good, <laughs> had gotten into some conversation about how New York is subsidizing uh, Kentucky and how Mitch McConnell was talking about not wanting to bail out blue states as opposed to supporting red states. And, you know, that's when Cuomo said something along the lines of, well, you know, all the taxes that come from New York, and we only keep this much while the rest of it goes into this pot that Kentucky ends up picking up. But that conversation in the middle of a tragedy, it's sad. It's, again, I think it's the system. I think it's the institution. And then, uh, you know, what do you do when your whole world is set up around capitalism, when your whole world you know, you pretend to have this democracy, but then in all in all actuality, those who have the money are the ones who are truly within the power. And everybody knows and understands that. Um, knowing that, that means that you have to do what you can to, to keep the system in place and you can then keep your place in the system by doing it. There's two things. It's, it's one, uh, one thing that I'm really centering a, a lot of my efforts, and it's really been my entire purpose, to be honest with you, is to, is to give people the opportunity to have a voice. And then on the opposite side of that is giving people the opportunity to hear what other people have to say. Professionally, I work in education. The whole goal within education is to then give people the ability to go out and assert themselves and be who they want to be in society, right? And to find agency to have voice truest expression of who you are is if you can live your days being happy in your own skin, moving that even further then is then respecting and understanding other people's voices and other people's presence and other people's purposes, giving you an opportunity to exchange thoughts and ideas about purpose with others and how you might be able to fit and work together. To be tangible about it, just thinking in regards to giving people voice. I'm the political action chair of our local branch of the NAACP. One of the responsibilities that I take very, very seriously is the ability for people to vote. And for those who are disengaged, whether by their own choice or by policies being disenfranchised, I think it is extremely important for everyone to have the ability to vote because your vote is your voice. Your vote is your opportunity to speak out, to be a part of the conversation and to make sure that you are respected and heard by those who are elected to take on your voice and your interests and your purpose as they guide our society. I have been doing uh, a lot of work within the area of my city that is more impoverished and oppressed to try to get those individuals educated on voting, uh, educated on policies, educated on who in our city is, are the individuals who you need to talk to if you have concerns about certain things and how to hold those individuals accountable if they're in elected position or how to uh, get people 
that are looking to become our leaders to be accountable before they get into position. And so um, I've done a number of different uh, community connection activities to where elected officials get in contact directly with uh, the populace. I've, I've tried and had successfully completed a lot of mobilization efforts to help people to the polls and work collaboratively on a number of efforts as far as with just getting people registered to then turn out. And so that's that's the voice piece. But then on the other side is the hearing of other people's voices. I'm also involved with the organization called the uh, Community Council for Racial Justice and Reconciliation out of uh, Omaha. It started actually a gentleman that was lynched in Omaha uh, by the name of Will Brown. He was a black man that was walking home on a, on a uh, I think it was a Thursday or Friday night, he was detained and then there was a, a, a mob of people that broke through the jails in the 19 teens and demanded that he be released to the mob. So tying this back into the situation of, of privilege and, and judge, jury, and, and executor being within the hands of those who actually have perceived authority, they pulled Will Brown out of the courthouse. And after hanging him, they mutilated him, shot him, set him ablaze. Uh, it was a lynching. It was one of the worst. You may have seen that it's a very popular image of his, of his body on a pallet of wood still catching the smoke still coming off of his frame. It's, um, it's very disturbing, very troubling. 2019 had been a hundred years since that lynching had uh, taken place. And a number of people throughout the city being inspired by Brian Stevens' work out of the Equal Justice Institute in Alabama, where they opened up the lynching memorial. Many people being inspired by that lynching memorial then had a conversation within the community about how do we go about honoring our community's history with racial lynching and injustice. Through our efforts, we started to have monthly conversations. I think at the smallest, we probably had 20 people, so, but, we, but, but upwards of 50 or 60 people uh, every single month that we would come together and explore the lynchings of the past and how lynchings have transformed into institutional racism that are still uh, abusing and disproportionately harming uh, black people and people of color within our city. And so um, giving people awareness about that is then giving Will Brown his voice back uh, and giving those that have been oppressed, the black folks in this city and people of color in this city, people in poverty in this city that have been oppressed, uh, giving them then a voice for those who have not heard those stories the significance of understanding health institutions, how educational institutions, how uh, business institutions, banking institutions, finance, and so on, how all of those different institutions through redlining, malpractice in health care, or the lack of access for businesses, for loans, all of those different things institutionally are still putting together modern day lynchings uh, that are taking place that are killing people in different ways. It's kind of going back to what Michelle Alexander talked about is Jim Crow now becoming James Crow Esquire, how segregation has gone from this outwardly violent, uh, perpetuating state of, of insecurity for Black folks to now uh, this more uh, covert and institutionalized and policy-driven way of keeping Black folks at bay. As Dr. Ibram Kendi, who just released uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, calls us to, to do. If you are aware of how racism is impacting folks, you have two choices. You can either be a racist and continue to do nothing to, to change those things, or you can choose to be an anti-racist. And now that you have the knowledge, go out and actually fight to end those injustices. And the hope is that as people are aware of it, they're not just shocked into understanding, but they're shocked into action. And so that's the, the, the thought behind the a lot of the efforts that go about around helping people to hear other people's voices.
to speak directly to that, I was trying to figure out what had changed. And my question was, why are these people so mad about the closing of the cities and the closing of the towns? I was like, where did this come from? What I posited was that initially the fear was COVID-19 could and will impact everyone, right? And so then <laughs> for a week or two, everybody was following the rules and everybody started, you know, you know, doing what they was told to do. I put two things at, at place as far as with the change in willingness to comply for those individuals, for the white folks that were at the state houses in Michigan and California and wherever else they were at uh, protesting. I, I look at one, yeah, you can get tired of being at home. Right. OK, I get that. You can get tired of not being able to do your normal life. But then at the same time, I also look at the time period in which it, the backlash kind of started was also the time period where you started getting the reporting of exactly what you just stated, which is that COVID-19 most dramatically and disproportionately was happening and impacting uh, at that point. It was just black communities. It was the black population. And it was a niche to believe because of the health disparities with high blood pressure and asthma and diabetes and so on and so forth. But then now as we've come along, we also find that a lot of the people of color, the black folks were essential workers who were still being required to go out to work and then thus exposing them in their communities. And now the same thing has come true about now with packing houses with a lot of our Latinx community is being exposed in there. And so once the narrative started to change to the black folks are disproportionately being impacted by COVID-19. And then the brown folks are disproportionately being impacted by COVID-19. Once it started being, again, those next two and not those who I am with, that I think is what incensed a lot of people more to where they said, oh, that's over there, so why am I having to change my life? Once it stopped being the, the global narrative, and started being people of color, black folks, brown folks, it started being that story. Some white folks started to say, well, I guess I'm off the hook for this one, so why do I not get to go out to the beach? Why do I not get to go to my hairdresser? And then rage comes. I think the media tried briefly to try to bring it back and started talking about nurse homes. But even in that situation, you started hearing the deputy um, governor in, or whatever he is in Texas talking about, we might be able to sacrifice our elderly so our young people can continue to live their lives the right way. I mean, just freakishly crazy comments like that. <laughs> it, but it just speaks to that point, right? Of the other, of the next, of someone that's not me having to be impacted to where we're willing to say, Nana, go ahead. Um, you, know, you go sacrifice yourself so that I can live my life. When I mean, what what value is that? What are we saying? If if America is supposed to be this wonderful place where we care so much about each other, um, it's that, that's a disgusting example of of where we truly rest in our hearts when it comes to ourselves and our own self interest versus the interest of the the whole. Gina, Gina, no, it's the economy. It, it, again, it comes back to what is a, our essential value, right? So you have two things that are at risk of being severely hurt right now. You have the economy that's really at risk, highly at risk, and then you have lives. So between those two, what are we going to prioritize, right? Don't look past this as a part of America. Don't look past this as a true testament to what America's values rest in. Lives versus the economy. And if there is no better example, knowing your history, Native American lives, broad and mass genocide, millions of people, and, and they're still here. I need to make sure I say that. My Native American family, my friends, but 
what was done with lives for the sake of economy. You think about slavery, what was done with lives for the sake of economy. You think about, and you're on the West Coast, so you think about the trains laying that track and how many, how the horrible living situations for those Chinese migrants that came in and lived and died under those horrible conditions and, and countless other instances Yep. It should not be surprising that we're talking about Meemaw getting out of the way so that we can keep our economy going, right? It is testament to what America, since before its founding, has actually been founded on. That's the truth about this country. The <laughs> so, no, but but it's, it's you give me an opportunity to kind of tell the other story of America, right? So yes, America is the the capitalism, the economy. We talked around discrimination and hate, but in, in the sake of the economy, but we we didn't touch on any war, which also you know military economy is a thing. Just understanding what America says we are and the responsibility that we all have to knowing the truth of where we are currently, but believing in what we said documented of what we were going to be. An imperfect nation, right? A continuously growing and trying to become uh, who we are. I'm a believer in restorative practices and restorative justice. And when injustices are done and when things have been done that are harmful, we should find ways to then try to restore. So in doing that, you, you, you center back to the question of what do we do moving forward? How do we restore this, this country? How do we restore uh, a life that was lost? There's a couple of different approaches, I think, to restorative justice in, this, in these cases. I think first is the lesson that I've learned from my ancestors is that as difficult as it is, we have to hold the truth of America up to America for it to see who it truly is. The civil rights movement was successful because of Emmett Till and the visual representation, unfortunately, of his slain body laying in that casket. The civil rights movement was, was successful because of, of Bull Connor. Uh, and, and him putting on water hoses, sicking dogs, batting people with billy clubs, and the media, your area, catching those actions and holding the truth of America up to its face. And having us take a second and say, you know, the same thing I did this morning when I looked in the mirror is I've got some work to do to get to where I want to be. The first thing has to be that, that raising and consistently raising awareness. And so as difficult and numbing as seeing those things come across our screens, our timelines, our social media feeds, whatever, it needs to be done because otherwise people will walk around believing in a society that does not exist. And so that's the first thing is we have to continue to communicate those things. But then secondly, the work needs to be done in you know, I'm going to go back to Dr. Kendi and talking about how we change and become anti-racist. He focuses in on 
you know, first you have to get people's minds to change and then you have to have policies change. Or first you have to have policies change and then you have to have the people's minds to change. One of the references he makes to, in his text is, you know, up until 40, 50 years ago, uh, interracial marriages had been banned and illegal in several states throughout the country. And so attitudes around interracial marriage in the 1970s weren't similar to attitudes that we have currently about interracial marriage. It was a lot more frowned upon in the 1970s, but still states decided to get rid of that unjust practice of banning people of different races from being married, despite people's current moods and attitudes of the 70s about interracial marriage. And so the policy changed before the attitudes changed, but you see now over 50 years, over 40 years, that because of a policy change that had to come forward, people's attitudes have changed, not all, but in a larger scale. We've grown and more and been more tolerant and accepting because the policy changes. But then you can also look at, you know, sometimes policies are driven. You know, the, the exact opposite of that would be speaking back to the civil rights movement, to where you had the, the Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas in 1954. The people got tired of segregation and they they kept forcing the conversation about why is separate, separate is unequal. The more and more people's minds and narratives started to change around that topic, then you saw the opportunity for policies to then change. And gradually, right, so it still was a gap before all states actually bought in, but now you, you have these, and again, not perfect. Some of course have just stated that segregation schools is worse than it was in the 80s or 70s or whatever, but the, the attitudes about how we deal with race in our country have changed. And so you change attitudes or social constructs and then you change policies. That's the way that I'm attacking my work as, uh, as an educator and then how I'm attacking my work as a community activist is I'm trying to change people's minds and I'm trying to change policies at the same time to where the, the fight is taking place in two different arenas, but it's a, a fight that has to happen synchronously in order to create the change that needs to happen. This was part two of our interview. You can hear part one at newsincontext.net. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing News in Context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on your favorite podcast channel. We're also on Twitter at News in Context SF, and you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening.